thank you for everyone for uh, giving up lunchtime to come join us here. It's really a cool thing. Um, I was just thinking about the questions, Shay, and uh, maybe if everyone could hold their questions until 2022 or three till we see how this whole region thing is going to play out, might be easier. But no, not really. <laughs> uh, go forward on the questions for sure. Uh, when we come up with the thought of doing this, we thought, well, we better start from the start. And starting from the start is not as easy as you think it would be. So you've noticed that by Shay's introduction, how to get started is for the next for the next trip here uh, towards the end of the month, we thought we'd go back even further than that and try and define regenerative agriculture and and uh, as much about what it it is as to what it isn't, and see how we go from there. So uh, I'll just uh, work on this um, on this slide and see how we go. So. I was born and raised uh, near a little town called Mount Gambit down the bottom of South Australia and lived in a, a, an area or a county called the Dismal Swamp, which is uh, by its very nature, uh, dead flat, no creeks, no rivers. Uh, and it was pretty much uh, uh, just a, a run out swampy block until about 1930. And it started a transition then, probably as much to do with a bit of drainage and uh, and things that helped along the way, but um, but but the change on that face happened um, around about 1930. For me, I, I got a, a a really good break, a lot of good breaks in my life actually. But I went, I took off after I left school for a little bit of diversity around Australia, and uh, I worked in the wool industry in New South Wales and then beef in Queensland, and I. I uh, came to Western Australia and, and did some time on the live sheep boats going to the Middle East uh, and, and also buying sheep there. And then I worked on down at Kojanup, had a, had a great couple of years there and then up to the Pilbara and had a, a, a stunning year in the Pilbara learning bull catching and all those dangerous things. But it was su such a diversity. And, and then when I came home uh, in 1992 to, to, to work on the farm, um, we had a diverse farm of beef, lamb, and potatoes, and and uh, it it was uh, it was diverse, but in a really old sense, I suppose. Uh, and and it also, in spite of being diverse, it didn't the farm didn't really tolerate new ideas very well. Um, and I suppose it was a collection of of the people in it, and and the family, and the aunts and uncles, and everybody involved in the family. Um, so we just had to. Um, learn to work together, uh, which is nothing extraordinary. Most family farms have to do that. But if you, if you came up with something different, it generally got, got sidelined um, for, for another time. So we didn't get that far. So it wasn't until my, my wife, Alexi, uh, who herself was, she was a high fat agronomist and sold a, an awful lot of superphosphate to people um, around the countryside, particularly in the Mallee cropping areas, uh, started to think, a bit later after we got married, what, what are we doing with, with the farm and with mum and dad? Um, we, we sort of were slowly extricating ourselves out of a much bigger family. So when we thought about a, a shift into, um, into something different, we, we actually got some training and, and uh, it was coincidentally that I should be working for RCS now. Uh, but it was about 21 years ago, we went and did a, a grazing for profit course with RCS. And, and what it took seven days to thump out of me is that I was seeing myself as a, a stock handler and a grain grower and a meat producer. And, and I, I just tended to think of myself as dominant over all of nature. And, and that was my ego, my, heath, my really healthy ego at work. And, and coming to terms with your ego, I reckon it's a, really, a, a big thing. It can be debilitating for some and, and empowering for others. And... And so long as you've got it under control, uh, I think that you can get somewhere, particularly in agriculture. Because if you get under control, you go from ego to eco and you start to see yourself as really part of the system. And I suppose that's an ecosystem. Um, funnily enough, I, I, I really want to stress too that what I've seen along the way is that we, we call it an ecosystem, but nature loves chaos. 
Um, n- n- nature is really quite chaotic. So that doesn't go well too much with, with a, a system. You can't really use chaos and system in the same sentence sometimes. So we got to accept that the ecosystem is chaotic. So then on the family farm, um, some of you might have experienced uh, what's called a battle of egos. And, and a battle of egos takes you all over the place. Um, and, and I think that uh, what we have to have as an agreement on the farm is that we're all part of the system. And all, well, none of us are going to master nature. We have, a, we have a desire to master nature, but it, it seldom works. What I'd come from was a long line of of practicing rescue remedy clinicians and and the rescue remedy we had for nearly everything um, to to recover a crop or an animal was to was to kill the offending organism that was upsetting it and uh, you know there's there's some really good developments that we've had in agriculture but but our mentality of killing everything is is probably not one of them and I don't know too many people who wake up in the morning and have a big stretch and go, gee, I can't wait to go out and kill something today. So when, when I realised that was, that was me, I, I didn't like the, the, the culture of going out and trying to find something that I could kill every time. It, um, it became a different thought process that I, that I woke up with. Our family have won a lot of awards on our farm uh, most of those awards were presented to us by the companies that made the input that we were using, and often that input would come in a uh, in one of these white drums. And it was almost a badge of honour that you would come home from town with a big pallet of these on the back of the back of the car and back of the ute and the trailer, and and go to use it. And uh, no one. No one really liked doing it. They just, someone got the job and, and they had to do it. So we would fix one problem and then we create another. We'd fix one problem and create another. And that's all we ever seemed to do. And some years it was easier and some years it wasn't. Some years nature set up some really challenging conditions like it always does. And we hoped that the answer would come in a white drum or blue drum. I went along to an Elaine Ingham seminar once and, and she had a great saying, if you wouldn't put it on your kids, don't put it on your soil, which a lot of people found it really hard to deal with. That, that, was, um, that was something that they hadn't really thought of before. But uh, if you start to use that as a bit of a mantra um, and, and you start to change your thinking, it helps a fair bit. So step back in, in time a little bit, like. Man's been doing a bit of damage to the, to, to the planet for, for a little while. Uh, and in the name of hard work, by dingoes, they could work hard, really hard. But modern day agriculture probably has got nothing on, the, on some of the, the violent practices, violence towards the soil of, of those olden times. Now, I think they were grand times by the looks of the work that they did, and, and I couldn't think of anything better than going out and working with those horses every day. Um, unfortunately, when they overlaid those systems onto some really poor structured soils like we had in Australia, it didn't work so well. And they, they just went for achievement after achievement after achievement. And, and that's just so noble, and, and, and I just get on my knees to those old timers who, who made Australia and, and agriculture what it is today. The records just fell everywhere. Horsepower, really until 75 years ago, hadn't, hadn't been trumped with anything better, although steam was, was helping a lot, but the, probably all the old horse handlers reckoned that steam was probably not going to catch on, nor to, to mention coal and oil. But they were living off the fat of the land. Fundamentally, there was plenty of fat to live off and each year it probably just depleted a little it happens so slowly it's a little bit like losing your hair you don't notice it happening overnight until one day you realize you haven't got much left but then there was a, a, a rapid escalation in productivity when they discovered what phosphorus might do uh, this, this is one of australia's only phosphate mines in, in mount isa uh, and and it was mothballed for about 
uh, 20 years uh, until suddenly phosphorus became scarce enough to open it up again. But there's um, the whole Pacific Islands that are now no more than a, than a crater for, for they've been mined their guano into, into oblivion. And, uh, and, and that had some really um, great benefits elsewhere in the world. It just unfortunately, it was a, the sacrificial lamb. Um, and and well, I do want to stress phosphorus is really necessary. We've got to, we've got to have phosphorus in our system. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we've had to go to some places now to get phosphorus that brings with it some, um, uh, some off-target uh, minerals that we don't really want in our system. So we get, a, we get a bang for our buck, but we bring with it some other things like heavy metals. So we've got to address that too. There's always a good story to overshadow a not so good story. Uh, and, and you have to listen to both of them, pretty much like every bit of news you ever get. So then for, for, for a long period of the, of the 20th century, the, you know, small scale holistic farming was, um, was pretty much practiced around the world. And, and uh, it's been a great uh, support mechanism for the whole food production of the planet. Really, we think that um, small farming systems uh, don't, don't create very much at all. In actual fact, um, I'll show you uh, statistically they a little more than we think. So they also shared a lot of culture. They shared a lot of labour and fertiliser and remedies and seed sharing, animal sharing, um, genetic sharing. There was, there was probably a lot more sharing that occurred between small farms in, in days gone by. Uh, and, and it's only probably a, a latter day thing where we keep a lot of this to ourselves and, and uh, probably think we have a competitive advantage over some other farmer that we've got to keep to ourselves as well. You know, holistic family farming, maybe when it was really holistic, didn't actually have a label. It was just considered family farming. Uh, and there were always corporates in amongst it. Australia has had corporate farming, corporate grazing, corporate pastoral holding since, since day dot. Uh, and it's happened in, in Europe and America as well. But, but largely, we have been farming, farming as families uh, for this time. And, and the, the definition of that is largely probably that they put their lifestyle first and their business comes second. And hopefully, they do it well enough to stay in business. Now, it's not always that way uh, because they're largely labour intensive by comparison. They're quite effective with their labour too, not to mention, but they're... They're time rich, often soil focused, plant diverse, and, and, and they have great rotations normally and, and uh, you know, very focused on their animals as, as part of it too, by and large. You would say that most holistic family farming practices tend to be aware of their impact on, on their environment and the soil and the systems. So here, here's a bit of progress along the way. Uh, in the 1920s, each farmer fed 19 mouths. In the 1970s, each farmer fed 26. And now, statistically, uh, well, past 2010s, we're around about 163 mouths that we're counting. And we're, we're uh, being told that we probably got to try and look to feed 210 mouths for each family farm by 2050. So... This kind of reduction ought to get us really excited, we would think, or this, this call to arms and call to action ought to get us excited. And often, particularly when it justifies um, some machinery upgrading for the people that like machinery. There's a bit of a flaw in some of this too, in that 25% of the raw produce that we grow is discarded or it's, it's fed to animals. So obviously it hasn't got a high enough value yet uh, and and I, can, I can say from experience that supermarkets are very tough on uh, physical blemishes, on, on particularly root vegetables, potatoes in particular. So at least 25% of what we grew had too great a blemish to be able to sell it on the shelf as a, as a fresh potato. And, and the, uh, the processing market, uh, well, didn't use our particular kind. So 
it's, a, it's pretty wasteful thus far. We've also got 10% of the planet is suffering serious malnutrition. It's something like 890 million people go to sleep each night with insufficient calories to sustain their growth. The thing is we don't have a food shortage. We have a food supply problem, serious food supply problem for one reason or another. But overall the planet, there's enough food for everybody. We just can't get it to places that it's needed. So quality, quality is the problem, not quantity. And access is the problem, not quantity. So it's actually 70% of the world's food supply still originates on small family farms. So if you think about it, it's, it's not just Australia that, that we need to be aware of. It's, it's uh, the Americas and Europe uh, and Asia and, and so forth is that we are um, still largely supplied by the small family farms, which is a great thing. They're under increasing pressure by governments and by corporations and by the bottlenecks that we have in supply to use things that may not be good for the farm and for the land itself. So such things as plant breeder rights that we're enforced to, to use in order to get access to a supermarket or to farm an enforced code of practice that, that's a, a one-size-fits-all approach and, and may well not suit our, our particular circumstances or how to conform to supermarket dominance. Um, and, and this seems to be one of the only ways that we can really sell profitably. Um, farmers markets haven't got enough toehold yet to be able to outcompete. We've got a really yield and quantity driven system. We, we're just interested in tons per hectare. It, we're really not that interested in the quality of the food, with the nutritional density um, and, and the elemental complexity of that food. We're really, we're really not growing for that because you don't get paid enough to, to, to do that. Sometimes you might branch into organics or biodynamics or some particular kind of um, niche area. And uh, having, having done one of those, um, I don't think I'd do it again. I think the codification is really quite quite a headache to keep um, keep working with uh, and, and the premiums are only just worth it, if at all. So a lot of the food is actually not really worth the, the energy, the, the, the diesel and the, and the time and the effort and everything that was put in to making it. And we actually have a net loss of energy as we, as we create that food. So that's a bit problematic in and of itself. And if we could get the consumer to ask the right questions and them to make demands on, on where they get their food from, then we might get a faster change, which could be valuable. We've got the whole of our modern grain growing supply system that is unfortunately pretty much rooted in a, in a dependency on chemistry. And most of that chemistry is toxic. Most of it's very toxic to soils. Not so toxic to humans, really, um, but, but it's actually the soils that, that have the problem. And most of our crops are heavily dependent on, you know, the basics of NP and K and some micronutrients and all of the sides that come in white 20 litre drums and, and find their way on a crop as rescue remedy. Uh, I, I like the phrase rescue remedy because that's what we're actually trying to do is we're continually rescuing a crop from, from death or from, from compromise. So we bring into the paddock and trucks and tractors and bags and tanks all that we ever need um, because we don't want to contemplate the disaster if we didn't. We're looking at genetically modifying a lot of crops now. And uh, there's a fundamental difference between genetic modification through trait selection, which we've been doing a lot, we call it seed breeding. We've been doing that a lot through the years and altering the DNA of the plant. And there's some, there's some instances that probably some genetic 
engineering might have some benefits to to humankind. I doubt that if we ate a really nicely balanced diet that we would need extra omega-3s or extra beta carotene or extra minerals. But to genetically modify a plant to be able to tolerate extra coatings of a herbicide is possibly not going to be the greatest advance in technology. So um, the distribution that is cornered by the companies that own the GM technology is probably uh, got something to do with how hard it's, it's pushed upon us. And um, I just wanted to show you this photo because I reckon that was distribution by a bunch of Corellas that was uh, quite problematic. And for years later, quite a lot of beautiful yellow plants came up around the district, all nicely spread out by Corellas. So that wasn't helpful. We've also, in vegetable production, got quite a, uh, an addiction to fine tilth. So we smash the soil up like anything in order to be able to get it uh, a base, a medium in which we can grow seeds and seedlings so that they will live for the 80, 90, 100, 120 days that they've got to live um, because their roots generally aren't good enough to get down into the normal soils that we present to them. So we use a lot of machinery and mechanics to do that. And that can be problematic in and of itself. We've got a monocultural tradition. So any poor foreign plant that comes up inside that monoculture is public enemy number one. And we have little or no tolerance of any of these things. We, we see them as robbers and, and moisture and nutrition thieves. So, you know, we don't listen to what Mother Nature is trying to tell us by why they're there. Rather, we believe that the reason they're there is because it's a lack of herbicide or, or, or a lack of something that we should be bringing to the paddock. There's some, uh, a bit of sadness, I think, that a lot of our research and, and training and, and learning facilities are heavily sponsored um, by uh, organisations that, that may, may have questionable reasons to be there. So I you know, draw this to your attention as to note who the sponsors are of the Glyphosate Sustainability Working Group down along the bottom of that sheet. So we only have glyphosate in our no-till armoury at the moment. And so we've become highly dependent on it. And, and we will be for some time. But what we have to figure out pretty soon is a way to use other chemicals in order or, or other methods in, other, in order to get the crops that we want uh, or to, to buffer down the impacts that we're having because I don't have any doubt that, that glyphosate has major impacts on soils and soil microbiology and soil biology. Uh, and I've seen it in, in lots of trials uh, already that um, we've got to do more to uh, expand our options. So let's look at some answers. Because what I painted was probably a bit of a, a, a negative picture that says if you're not regenerative, then you must be degenerative. And I don't want to focus that way. What I'd like to say is that there are answers already to nearly all of these things. And they look a bit like this. So here is generally a, a water point that you would find on any given pastoral property in Australia, depending on how long the dry season has been. But they generally end up looking like this. There's a lot of missing plants there. And there's a lot of concentrated nutrient. And apologies. My apologies. And uh, we've got to then look at how we redistribute that nutrition and that nutrient. And we can change the grazing management that we use quite simply and quite easily. To, to distribute that across a whole paddock or a whole landscape quite easy. And, and in doing so, we do good for all of the biology that's out there. We have water that flows across and not through the soils in most of Australia. And it wasn't always this way. That's a photo there of the front of a flood. That is the first trickle of a flood coming across a plain in Western New South Wales 
north of Tilpa on the Darling River. And the water is flowing across the landscape and not through it because there's no air and there's no um, there's no capillary movement through the, left through the soils. And it wasn't always that way. Yes, we had floods and days gone by, but uh, the landscape had much more movement of water through it than across it. Our waters run too fast, mostly, uh, across our landscapes now. And we get riverbank collapse because of the speed of which water runs across our landscapes. So we know how to slow that down. We know how the practices we can use to, to slow that water down and, and have a much more infiltrating our, our landscapes. So we can do that already. On the barrier reef, we've got some really big issues with silt discharge out of the rivers and the, and the blooms that, that merge out across the reefs. And they're very intolerant of this, and understandably so. And ironically, that darkness that you see there, that's actually paid for real estate. Somebody actually paid for that and has gone down the river and out to sea. Now, it wasn't always that way. So what we've got to do is figure out how to stop that and do it quickly, both to save the real estate and the reef, but also to keep the nutrient where it was laid down in the first place and to keep those fines in the soil. In, in Mallee sands, not just in South Australia, but there's many kinds of Mallee sands where we've got a, a really hydrophobic non-wetting issue. And we already know how we can introduce biology to break that down and to get added fertility into the soil. So we have a, a, a wonderful double win by introducing biology into non-wetting sands and keeping it there. We have frosted problems. This is frosted wheat, but we have frosting problems that seem to get worse and worse. And it's largely because there is less and less carbon in the soils to keep the, the soil temperature up. Uh, there's less and less sugar in the plants and sugar freezes at a lower temperature than water. So the, the plants need to have high sugar levels in order to become frost tolerant. And we know how to do that already. We just got to do more of it. We've got fire. We've had fire this year of all years as, as a destroyer. And if we use regenerative landscape management, um, we can make it a creator. See, Australia is always going to, has always had fire, is always going to have fire. And we can either choose whether it's going to be a creator or a destroyer. And regenerative systems can really help manage that to the positive. We've got some pretty high maintenance livestock grazing systems because most of our animals are grazing a lot of shallow rooted grasses. They don't have good access to deep rooted perennials to get a really great mix. See, all they are is a room and walking around on four legs full of microbes, feed the bugs. And what we're gonna feed the bugs is a diversity of nutrition that comes from a, a three dimensional profile underground. And the grass is just a result of how well you worked on that soil. So they also need a high quality water. Most animals are not getting high, high quality enough water and enough of it because it's the most useful nutrient they can pick up and consume much more than just a hydrator. So we have some landscapes in Australia that are side by side telling us. So on the right hand side, we have one neighbor on the left, another uh, who has probably got a higher value on the, the grass and the condition that we that we see as spiraling upwards or spiraling downwards. And if our, if our soil condition and soil health is spiraling upwards, the indicators on the surface, such as the vegetation and the animals that live off that or the crops or whatever, are going to be better for it. We've got to spiral everything upwards. So when we have a chance to put a plant in the ground and get it to grow, and that might be in some really hot, dry times in, in summer, but if we can use a little bit of moisture that we, we pick up to get something to grow, it's better than having it bare and in the name of moisture conservation. Because in actual fact, you are really only conserving about 10% of what falls at that time. So we are better off 
getting biology into the soil that have a better blotting paper effect of any nutrient, even if only 10% of that green grew, you're better off than leaving it bare. Here we got just a, a double crop example. So that's wind growing, wind growing rhicorn out of lucent. Uh, and uh, both have really high, high sugar levels and, and high integrity. And we've got some really great grasses here um, that are in a rotational grazing system that may look like they haven't all been utilised. But what we're doing is leaving a little bit for the future. We don't have to always take everything for now. That is really what the essence of regeneration is all about. We can just take what we need for now, work out how much is enough, and leave some for the future. We might tread it in, we might pass it through an animal and pass it out as manure, uh, or we might, we might somehow lay it on the ground mechanically. But we're feeding back to the soil some of the energy that we captured in the first place. In Northern Australia and in pastoral country, it's even simpler to do it because managing the grazing is is not that difficult once we have a good dynamic system that we're working on and grass that just wants to grow. So filling in all the gaps that we currently have with annuals or perennials and, and having it, some of it will be palatable, some will be digestible and some won't. But nevertheless, it's, nature's all got a use for it. And working with nature and just being there as a guest um, probably takes a bit of the ego out of what we're looking at doing here. Likewise, with sheep, we can, we can get some numbers into the system and use the hoof and tooth and, the, and the, the impact of those animals to do good work on our landscapes. Because fundamentally, the, uh, the law of thermodynamics says that energy is not made or lost, it's simply transferred. So when you look at that flock there, there is a lot of energy in that flock to transfer energy through the soils. What we're gonna do, as Charlie Massey famously said, is in his book of, called The Reed Warbler, is that we've got to change the square foot of real estate between our ears in order to want to change the approach to our regenerative practices. That's where the biggest change is going to occur. So at RCS, we look at the three legs of the pot that we can work on in, in working on regenerative production, regenerative business, and regenerative land management. And that keeps the people in that pot just bubbling along nicely. And if one of the legs on that pot becomes weak and wobbly, the people can generally feel it. And when the people feel wobbly, the whole system breaks down. If the people feel secure, then the whole system grows and, and, and spirals upwards and regenerates. So... In conclusion, I, I want to leave you with the thought that Mother Nature is always going to win out. No matter how smart we think we are, she will always win out. And so by defining how we intend to farm and, and working in parallel with Mother Nature, it defines our commitment to the future of, of what we're going to do. We borrowed a lot from the future agriculture and we'll have to give it back sooner or later. Regenerative agriculture really draws a line in the sand and from here on as farmers we've got to reinvest in that life and with mother nature as well. So thanks very much for having me Shay and uh, I wish all those wonderful regenerative farmers out there every success and uh, I hope that we get to interact a lot more. Thanks, Nita. I think that was awesome. Um, I think people should have got lots out of that. I know I did. Now we had some like, so if you have a question, pop it into the chat box and we'll be able to answer that. But there was some questions that were um, sent through earlier. So there was one here that I really like that I'll start off with. Um, so I talked to a lot of good farmers who are actively pursuing many of the strategies of regenerative agriculture, including no-till, soil testing, applying lime, 
uh, maintaining ground cover, but they don't identify as regenerative farmers. Do you see this as a problem or is it sufficient that the practices are being employed regardless of the banner under which they are employed? And secondly, if it is a problem, how do you think it should or could be addressed? Can you just tell me what the, what the problem was again? So people who aren't identifying as regenerative farmers. Who aren't? So they're doing the things that regenerative farmers might do, but they're deciding not to, like, brand themselves as regenerative farmers. Is that... Um, oh. Do you see that as a problem? Not at all. Not at all. It's a really good question um, that we were talking about before because when I uh, talked to my dad about the possibility of becoming certified organic, it was not well received, to say the least. Uh, and, and he lived in fear that we were about to stuff the whole thing up, let alone actually be like those long-haired hippies that affiliate and associate themselves with organic agriculture. So it was a label and a tag that uh, we didn't talk much about. Um, we just wanted to get on and, and do it for the sake of the uh, increased gross margin, actually, was what we were looking for. Uh, to label oneself for the sake of a label is, is not a... Um, a, it's not compulsory, B, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, and C, if that separates people, um, then we've got to bring them together. So I would rather people don't call it anything but call that, you know, that they're in love with their soil or, or biologically enthused or whatever. I don't, I don't mind. But to... To say that um, we are regenerating land, rehabilitating land, uh, is a pretty good analogy, analysis of it, because what we've been doing for a fair while is not that. I completely agree with you there, Nick, um, as long as they're farmers are doing the best thing for their soils and the health of their land I think that's the most important thing um some more questions that came through um, I suppose some of them relate a little bit to the next webinar that we're going to go into but so one person says like how do we get started or what are the most impactful steps a part-time land manager could take while holding down a day job well what Watch closely on the next uh, webinar that we have, but I'll give away a little bit of it right now. The starting point is, as Charlie Massey said, that you want to do this badly enough to, to change your mind and change your attitude and, and, and work on that square foot of real estate between your ears. Read, 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 read. The answer to everything that we want to know is written down somewhere. Um, we have to be careful that we know uh, how to get through and across the other side um, and, our, and our soils are going to behave differently as we get them off a um, the rescue remedy farming. And our crops are gonna behave differently and we're gonna to have to accept that we're giving a bit back in order to get stuff in the future. So um, again, that's, that's kind of like a, an attitude of acceptance and then when you look at the amazing um, feats of Mother Nature, that she generally wants to keep you in business. That's the irony of it. Uh, she's not trying to put you out of business. It's us that are doing some crazy things that fly in the face of good biological principles that tend to take us out. Yeah. So is there ways that people sort of measure how they... Are regenerating their landscape is like yeah yep. yeah yep definitely uh first and foremost i would just use all the visual indicators that you can so you go soil testing with a shovel take a shovel everywhere you go and if you walk all over your farm and in every shovel full you you lay it on the ground and you find a half a dozen worms in every shovel full i would say that you don't have to waste your time listening to any more nick kentish webinars ever 
you are just fine. If not, there's probably a little way to go in getting the biological activity going in the soil. And then uh, looking at what you produce, uh, how resistant it is to disease, uh, um, how resistant it is to insect pressure. I'll, I'll, I'll share some stuff with you later on about, um, about the natural insect resistance that every single plant has. Uh, and if we can enhance that natural resistance, there's a whole lot easier than buying it in a, in a white 20 litre drum. So, and also another thing that I would encourage everyone to own and play with is a refractometer. Um, so, so get one and, and learn to use it, muck around with it and test your food, test your grass, test your wheat, test your lupins and, and everything and, and see um, what changes you notice that, that comes along with the increase in, in nutritional density of that food. So then there's another question. If we're not using the term regenerative agriculture to actively promote, how do we engage people to learn and adopt practices? Well, it's a, I suppose we can engage them by setting an example that finally, as I said, most people don't get out of bed in the morning, have a stretch and go, gee, I can't wait to go and kill something, but I just have to because that's all I know. And one day they learn that such and such down the road, so and so down the road has been doing this for ages without it. And if you are open to the conversation to help those people, they will eventually come and ask. Uh, and, and if you just talk about it, normally people and say, well, I've discovered, I've discovered something really unique that my plant has a natural built-in resistance to this insect or that insect or whatever insect we talk about at a barbecue, you attract people's attention <laughs> and they generally want to know more. They might go home and be battling and struggling with it for ages until finally probably their very smart wife will say to them, well, Sunshine, why don't you go down and ask him? He'll tell you probably. He's probably dying to tell you what he's been doing, even though he doesn't call himself a regenerative farmer. I suppose a lot of it is trying to connect with those like-minded people and like-minded farmers out there and I suppose that's where Regen WA is really trying to connect people up and through webinars like this hearing from yourself and other people online who might have ideas and thoughts. We still have a few minutes so if anyone wants to unmute themselves to ask a question or provide a comment for Nick that would be good um, but there's also what did we say down here? Oh in response to your, what you're just saying Nick would it not be better to create a community of practice around the term, i.e. networks of growers, grower groups, and to facilitate greater adoption and or learning? Yeah, absolutely. Whatever, whatever your medium is, whatever, whatever group or, look, start a group. Just get a bunch of like-minded people together and, and have, you know, every second Friday afternoon um, farm walk and, and, and a beer and a wine um, or just enjoy each other's company and, and share the knowledge. Like I said before, small family farms have been sharing knowledge for a very long time. They've been sharing seed. They've been sharing bulls and rams. They've been sh sharing genetic material. They've been sharing ideas and apothecaries and remedies and all sorts. So why stop now? Uh, yeah. Uh, Shay, John Hicks, um, uh, uh, nature farmed this continent, uh, uh, this land, Australia, successfully set for 700,000 years. The Aboriginals farmed it successfully. They enhanced it in the last 70,000 years. Now we've just about ruined it in the last 70. And the reason, what we've got to do is imitate nature and then enhance it, improve it. And what did nature do? Nature had deep-rooted perennials. What are we doing? 
sowing shallow rooted annuals. There's something wrong there. So we've got to look at how we get some deep rooted perennials or at least deep rooted annuals into our farming system. It's easy in the higher rainfall areas where you can uh, grazing is totally feasible. It's harder as you get out into the lower rainfall areas until you get out into the station country where it's the only option you've got. And uh, we've got to, uh, we've, the next slogan is the soil runs on carbon. The biocarbons or carbohydrates. I wouldn't be talking to you now if it wasn't carbohydrates that are making me sit upright and you wouldn't be presenting. So we've got to look at how we get our soil carbon back up again because ever since European agriculture started in any part of the world, they've been living off their carbon bank. They've been depleting it. And we need to look, get back to, well, how do we get carbon? Oh, I, but I plough my struggle in. Yeah, doesn't work. And at the present time, it helps, but it's not, not a big enough help. It's a bit like saying, oh, I'm paying off my debt a dollar a year. Well, you'll be a long time paying off much debt. Sure. And, 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 so, and I'll just add one other thing. North America, North American research is 20 years ahead of it. Uh, certainly West Australian research, I can't speak too much about the rest of Australia, but I would say uh, with the exception of possibly one or two states, we are well behind because all the land care agencies over there are aware of the need to regenerate their farmland. Our agencies the bun uh, haven't felt the bump yet. Thanks, Nick, and thanks for a good presentation. Thanks, John. Uh, I want to tell you a, a, a quick story if I've got time. So, uh, I had a wonderful, wonderful boss at Cojanup who just shared a lot with me, and he'd been involved in the Esperance land development um, when we started that in the, in the 40s. And he's, he told me about uh, a bit of a rort that was going on where they, they had some 10,000 acre blocks and the, the guys had uh, crawler tractors out there and they, they were clearing um, patches of it, just, just patches. And it was really only the good dirt patches they were clearing, but they were also getting a subsidy. And they were claiming the whole 10,000 acres, but they were probably only clearing about five. Anyway, somebody from Primary Industries quickly got onto that little rort and, and uh, put a new rule in place that it, there was to be nothing left. Stick no sticks, no nothing, fence to fence, every last stick gone. And he said, he said, Nick, we knew it was wrong. We knew it was wrong to do. It was, uh, the legislation was there, we had to do it in order to get our subsidy. We knew it was wrong. He said, it's just like when I go out and I spray this chemical, we're actually mixing up some um, uh, uh, fast act for red-legged earth mite and we're all dressed up in our protective gear. And he said, I, I hate this. I hate this. I know it's wrong, but I don't know any better. I don't know what else to do. Just like I didn't know in the Esperance land development what else to do. So that's where we are. But the funny thing is now we know so much about what to do. That's the good thing. Thanks, Nick. Liz, did you have a question that you wanted to... Jay, you must have read my mind. Read, read your face. Good morning, I'm Liz Brennan. I'm a director with Wide Open Agriculture, just to display my conflict of interest. Um, so my question, and it stems back to that point around regenerative agriculture um, and the term, because I find it can be quite a polarising term and it creates an us and them mentality. And what I know, because I work in R&D internationally in ag research, and what I know about um, researchers is actually the more you engage with people and it's, it's, it's like getting rid of the science. It's, it's actually people that make the difference. So you've got to bring people along the journey and have you un have them understand what it is that you're trying to achieve. Um, so it's, I think until we cut, we kind of get over, address that issue around the definition of regenerative agriculture, um, which is my point around um, 
you know, communities of practice and, and bringing people along for the journey. Um, and so, so my question, and like, as I was just hearing the, the former gentleman talk about the science, I feel like we're, we're preaching to a bit of a converted crowd here. My question is, how do we grow this? How do we make this even bigger? And I actually think it comes back to regenerative agriculture being um, a little bit tricky to define which I fully appreciate, but it's so contextual. So I guess I'm curious as to see how um, um, how we can break down those barriers and encourage more farmers to get on board. Well, what you're doing at Wide Open Agriculture is is par excellence. I'm not just saying that um, because it's you, Lizzie. It's 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 brilliant. It's cleverly put together, uh, and and I think it goes to the, the heart of what the driver is, is the person who eats it in the end. That there's not a person in the city I've ever come across who says to me, oh, don't, don't worry about that good food rubbish. We, we, we'll just take any old crap you send us. I've never come across someone who says that. They all say, good on you. Oh, we love to think that you farmers out there doing good for your soils and doing good things for your ecosystems. Uh, there are, what, 135,000 bona fide registered for GST farmers in Australia out of 25 million people. Um, we are insignificant as far as consumption goes. We just have quite significant as how production goes. And if we look at the possibilities of our real estate driving the system, i.e. the soil, currently most of us are just sitting on a bunch of rocks actually, but if you add biology to rocks, you get soil, then we are seen to be good uh, custodians of the land. And that's what I, I think that not, not enough farmers have ever painted their own vision to, to be really checked out as good custodians of the land up against all of the, so we can do it like any 60 minutes camera is over our shoulder. That's why I say with low stress stock handling, we got to do it like there's, we handle our animals like there's a 60 minutes camera over our shoulder all the time. We have to use practices on the land that there's a, we are open to scrutiny of anybody that says, well, you know what, I'm actually sacrificing a little bit of production here so that I can give you consumers the very best of what I can do as a food practitioner. Yeah, I would agree. And I think um, that the importance of communicating your value and our value as regenerative farmers and those involved in regenerative agriculture is critical because as you quite rightly put, consumers do want to know that we care for our land and our natural resources. But until we're able to act like coherently, it's like the elevator pitch, articulate what regenerative agriculture is and what value that provides, um, which is why I guess I bang on about the regenerative agriculture term because I get that it's politically loaded but I'm really keen to shift the dial on that because I see it as such an amazing philosophy, movement, science, um, and I want more people on board. So I found wherever I got painted into a corner, I used the word biology or biological or, or bio, life. Uh, and, and I had, he's probably not on this call, but my dad, I wish he was, uh, I would... I would say that I had to get around dad so many times in my life and I just kept saying biology, biology dad. And if I can add to that, biology is the thing and it's like any living thing, don't do anything to kill it. And everything that we spray on or put on as a chemical fertiliser is killing it or killing some of it. And to that end, Glyphosate, we know, is a very good killer of everything above the ground. It's also a pretty good killer of nearly everything below the ground. Thanks, John. Um, Nick, there was a question posted on the comments saying, how important is Indigenous engagement to this? Do we know if their traditional farming practices would fall in the regenerative category? Uh, if, if, uh, if dark emu is as well-researched as I think it is, Everybody, every person in Australia should read it. Uh, and there's going to be a whole lot more learnings that come out through that. But uh, I, have, uh, I have not enough years left in my life to learn what Indigenous culture did in um, 
you know, the 70, 80, 90,000 years before we got here uh, in, in order to, it just um, it is, it is an incredible amount to learn from that. So how important? In incredibly important. Yeah. Well, it's one just after 1.30 here. So if there was any dying questions at the end, otherwise I'll like to say thanks to Nick and everyone for participating today. Okay, thanks Nick. Thank you so much for your time today and thanks everyone for participating. I know I learned a lot and I think everyone else in the room did as well. Um, and just and so next, Regen WA would really like to be keep running these webinars and the idea is to obviously share ideas with like-minded people. So Nick's was the first one of the series and then next week we'll actually have Nicole Masters on the 14th of May. So head to the Regen website if you haven't booked tickets for that one yet. Um, I'm also working with some local WA farmers to do some, some of these sessions as well. I like the idea of doing them over lunch so people can sort of take a break in their day and have a listen and keep them nice, short and sweet. Um, and then Nick will be joining us for another, some more later in the month and as we go into June as well. So um, stay, keep informed and I um, really, yeah, really appreciate everyone coming together today. So thanks, Nick. Thank you very much. Bring on the rain. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Nick.